it real quick because I haven't done it yet. Look in the camera and say, if you're joining us this morning, good morning. Welcome, 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 welcome. We are so glad you're joining us online this morning. So over the last few weeks and for the next few weeks, we're addressing a dynamic that takes place, takes place in churches every Sunday. That, that feeling that we are better people because we've been to church, right? That feeling guilty, and we talked about this in week one, feeling guilty is some kind of religious experience, right? That we've learned, what we've learned is from James and Jesus says that you're kidding yourself, right? Like being in the building, listening, believing what you hear makes you better. Like somehow that makes you better. No, no, no. At the end of the day, what is it? Application makes all the difference, right? You have to do what it says. James actually wrote that in a letter that he wrote to the Christians in the first century. He said, but don't just listen to God's word, right? Because if you just listen to God's word, you're never going to be able to read that with that thing in the background, okay? Don't ever just listen to God's words, but you have to do what it says, right? Otherwise, you are just fooling yourself, right? It's like the saying that the quote that we read, that unapplied truth, unapplied truth is like unapplied paint. It doesn't do anybody any good, right? So just, so, for example, joining a health club doesn't get you in shape just because you joined the health club. All right? Listening to somebody lecture on how to be organized won't make you organized. You have to do what they say, right? You have to go to the health club, right? So we've been talking about five, five things that we're calling life apps, big life apps. And in, uh, in week two, we talked about the forgiveness app. We talked about the forgiveness app. And we learned that what? Forgiven people what? Forgive. That's right. Forgiven people forgive people. We're forgiven, so therefore we forgive. And last week, last week we took a, uh, a look at one of the most underrated apps I think there really is, and that was the what? The, the, the rest app. The rest app. And I say one of the most underrated because of the response that I got back from you people that were listening after last week. And it really pointed out to the fact that we're missing the mark on rest. And the big idea was this. The big idea was that your life moves to a better place when you move at a sustainable pace. When you slow down and you take time to rest, your life moves to a better place, right? And today's life app isn't going to be much easier. In today's life app, some of you are not going to like what you have to hear, but today's life app is the life app of confession. The life app of confession. Now, <clears throat> it's really interesting. If you have any kind of Catholic background or have ever been involved with the Catholic Church in any way, you immediately think of the sacraments. Sometimes it's called the sacrament of penance. And this is somehow, this is, this is how you get your sins absolved after you get baptized in the Catholic Church. That you go to a priest and you confess your sins. Now, if you're a Protestant, you think, oh, confession. That's when I sin, and then later that night after I've sinned, I tell God that I'm sorry, and then that he somehow forgets everything that I did, right? Then, then when I do the same sin again, he doesn't know that I've done it because he forgot it because I, I prayed and asked him to forgive me the last time, right? He's not all that clued in, right? And in all religious systems, all of them, I'm telling you, in every religious system there is, the Catholic system, the Protestant, the Baptist, Presbyterians, heck, even outside the Christian faith, in all religious systems, there is some kind of scheme or there's, there's an effort that we are in some way, we're going to outsmart our God, right? All of them do. It, there's a way in which, and of course, the Protestants I'm going to pick on us because I am one. Uh, it, it, the, the Protestants, one of, the, there's the one that we think God is so dumb that once we confess my sins, he forgets them. And then I repeat them, and he thinks, oh, that's the first time you've done that, so I'm going to forgive you. And again, it, it's kind of an abuse of the Catholic system, but we just changed it to what fits our religion. And, and, and this is the way that it's supposed to work, right? But some of you here, many of us here, most of us here, if we're really honest... The whole penance thing is about what? It's about emptying your sin bucket so that you can go out and do it again. Because isn't it true that, that we have a tendency to confess the same thing over and over and over and over again? And believe God is going, oh, there you go again. You did it for the first time. Right? In every religious system, when it comes to sin, there's some sort of ploy to try to outsmart God. 
And here's the problem with that. Outsmarting God, trying to outsmart God, is a sin. And if you have some sort of system where you're treating God like he's an idiot or some kind of gotcha, or, or you've kind of found the loophole, then you are dishonoring God. And trying to find a loophole in your theology or a loophole with God, that's a sin. And it's so dishonoring to God. And that's the one sin, guess what? That's the one sin that none of us ever confess to. Now, let me try to get to the point. Like, like, so here's the point that I'm trying to get. If you're a Catholic or if you have a Catholic background, you should know this. But if you don't, here's, if you're Protestant and you've never been Catholic, here's something really interesting, right? The whole confession system that the Catholic Church, that, that you are accustomed to, that they're accustomed to, didn't show up until about the year, around the year 600 A.D. You know what that means? It's not a Bible thing, right? There was 600 years between Jesus and where the confessional booth was developed. And about 300 years between the first Bible, the written Bible that Constantine put together, and that, the, the system that they use. And again, it's not a bad thing. It's just not a Bible thing. And here's the, here's the convicting about all of that. It didn't begin as penance. What? Yeah, that's not what it started at. It began, and get this, do you know what the word penance comes from? Repentance. And you see, you know what the problem with repentance is? It's way worse than penance. Because penance is, you, you got to go, you got to go through penance. But repentance is like, oh, wait, that's like repent, meaning I can't do it anymore. Like, we, we, we like penance better than we like repentance because we want to do it some more. We want to be forgiven. But then when it comes, that's where it comes from, right? And in fact, check this out, check this out. And if you don't believe me, go to a Catholic church and ask a priest. In the old days when this system was actually originally came together, you only confessed a sin that you did one time. Because here's the thing, the expectation was that once you confessed it, you weren't going to go do it anymore. Right? That was the expectation. But really, at the end of the day, what kind of system is that? Okay, now, Protestants, before you get too excited, before we get too excited, and they, oh, he's bashing the Catholic, no, 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 no. You need to know this. Come on. When you confess your sins to God, he doesn't forget your sins. You know how I know that? Because your mama won't let him forget your sins. Your brother won't let him forget your sins. Your ex-spouse, your ex-husband, your ex-wife will not let him forget your sins. And all your friends and all the people at work, people talking about you. And the more notorious of a sinner you are, the more people talk about your sin. And you confess your sin to God every single night, but there's dozens of the people walking around talking about you out loud. Did you see what he did? Can you believe he did it again? And God's going, he did what? I had, I'd forgotten all about that, but thanks for telling me. Now I know. And it's like, okay, now I just made all of that up. Nobody's walking. They might be talking about you. And it's not all true. And I might have even gone a little bit over the top, right? But here's the deal. Although people do talk about your sin, God doesn't forget about him. Scripture doesn't teach us that. Now, there's a couple of verses that have been kind of twisted and manipulated, way out of whack, to say that he does forget our sins. Now, here's how God, you know how I know God doesn't forget your sin? Get this. And if you're a Bible person, you know this story. Do you remember that Old Testament story about King David? And King David and that she who shall not be named? Like, in case God forgotten, I didn't want to mention her name. I mean, uh, come on, the Bible documents sin that people did. God knows the story of David and Bathsheba. Do you think that that's the only sin that God forgo hasn't forgotten is the one about David and Bathsheba? No, God doesn't forget your sin. And I just kind of throw all that random information at you to point to this arena of huge 
confusion when it comes around to this, this area of confession. That somewhere along the way, you began to believe, I began to believe, that I, I, don't, I don't know if somebody taught us this or if it's just something that we assumed. I don't know where it came from, but most of us, probably all of us, some way, somehow, at some point, believed that confession, the reason confession was, was the point of confession was to relieve our guilt or to relieve our conscience. And over time, confession really became all about me. I feel like there's something between me and God. I feel bad for what I'm doing or done. How do I get rid of this guilt? How do I get rid of this bad feeling about what Pastor John's talking about right now? How can I do that? How? What, what can I do? Oh, I get it. I'll confess to God. God, I, want, I just want to confess my sins to you, and I feel better now. I'm going to confess my sin to a priest, and now I feel better. I'm just going to get on my knees alone at night after I've done the same thing that I've done the last four nights in a row, and I'm going to confess my sins to you. And for some reason, we think confession is all about guilt relief. We think confession is all about clearing our conscience. Now, when you open up scripture, scripture, this is not what you find at all. In fact, when you study the scriptures about the word confess or confession, you know what? When you look up all the words and all the things around the words confess and confession, there is never any passages in the entire Old Testament or New Testament that bring the idea of confession and conscience together. None. So where did it come from? But here's what you will find in Scripture. That genuine confession, genuine confession, and when we're going to look at a few passages here in a few, a few minutes, that genuine confession, real confession, like Bible confession, serves as the first step towards something different. Genuine confession serves as the first step towards Repentance. Oh, that's like I don't do it anymore? That's right. It also points towards reconciliation. As in, when you sin against someone else, true confession leads you back to the person you sinned against to make things right. True confession is, I'm not going to have, any, have a secret confession between me and God. Real confession is, I'm going to tell God I'm sorry, and then I'm going to go to you, and I'm going to tell you. I'm sorry. Real confession is I'm going to open the lid of my soul to someone other than God. Because I like to keep the lid of my soul closed and keep it duct taped and super glued. Because I don't want no one to see what's inside of here. So inside my soul, me and God can have all kinds of conversations. And they're the same conversations over and over and over again. I confess the same thing over and over and over and over again, and, but there's never any change. But guess what? I feel better about myself. But when you embrace confession or the idea of confessing the way that Scripture teaches, the way that James, and G, uh, the, the way that Jesus taught, it's threatening. You know what it's threatening to? Change, because it results in change, which is the ultimate goal of confession. That, in fact, genuine confession, genuine confession leads to genuine change. There's your big idea. Genuine confession, you're going to hear me say that about four more times throughout this entire message. Genuine confession leads to genuine change. That's what confession is, was given to us for. God never intended for us to come up with these internal games that make us feel better about ourselves and relieve our conscience from what we've done. It was never intended for, for that. Religious systems have developed that. We've developed that. But genuine confession, genuine confession leads to genuine change. In fact, <clears throat> if you were to look at all the passages in Scripture, in the Bible about confession, get this. Most of them, most of them have people uh, going to confess to other people and not to God. There are, 
You confess to God, and then, but all of them point to you going to other people. In fact, there's almost no teachings, almost none, there are some in there, about confessing your sins to God. But when, there's, when there is reference to confessing your sin to God, it's almost always attached to confessing your sins to other people. Almost always. And people against whom you have sinned, and people that can hold us accountable to make sure that there is repentance, and when necessary, reconciliation, right? Now, real quickly, I want to give you some examples, and we're going to start off in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, when God had delivered the nation of Israel, right? So God delivered the nation of Israel from Egypt, right? This was the whole Moses, let my people go, plagues, the the water split, they walk across, you know, that whole story. And then they don't know, but they don't know anything about how to live, as, an, as a sovereign, you know why? Because they've been slaves. They've been slaves for 400 years. They were slave states. So everybody who came out of Egypt, all they knew was how to be a slave, right? And being a slave, let's be honest, being a slave is kind of easy, right? You know how you be a slave? You just say, yes, master, and then you do whatever they tell you. That's about it. You don't have any rules. You don't have a society. You are just told what to do, and you don't have to think for yourself. So God gave them a a social order in the Old Testament. We call it what? The Ten Commandments, right? And then there's like 630-some-odd laws that came out of this old Ten Commandments, right? And here's just one about confession. Check this out. In the book of Numbers, one of those books that nobody likes to read because it's Numbers, um, Right? Here's what he says. He says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Give them the following instructions. Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. If any of the people, man or woman, nobody's excluded from that, betray the Lord by doing what? Wrong to another person, they are what? Guilty. This is this is it. That's it right there. Right? You do something against them. In any way, whether it could be a verbal wrong, or a stealing wrong, a mistreatment wrong, anybody who mis- mistreats someone in any way has betrayed the Lord. <laughs> really? It's interesting. That's, that, that's, he says if, if you mistreat a person, you're betraying God. Let me say that again, just, so, <laughs> just in case you guys are sleeping. Wake up. Here we go. If you mistreat a person... You've betrayed God. Nowadays, nowadays, we like to split those two things apart. Like we go to church and we get on our knees and we say, God, me and you are cool, right? We're all right? We're good? Check? All right? I hate her. That's okay. But me and you are good, right? And God's going, no, 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 no. If you hate her, me and you are not good. If you hate him, me and you are not good. You can't hate her and love me. We, uh, now, we, we love to distinguish them, and that impacts our confession, doesn't it? Because I can treat you terribly and get on my knees and say, God, I'm sorry that I treated her terribly. Are we good? Are we cool? Everything's all right, right? And we think God goes, oh, yeah, we're good. No problem. You don't have to tell her. You don't have to go to her and confess. Just tell me. We're good. And even in the Old Testament, God said to Moses, make sure everybody knows that if you treat her badly, if you treat him badly, that you are betraying God, you are offending God. These two things are one and the same. They go together. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning, right? Right? He continues. They must. And now here we go. Here's here's our introduction. This is 101 Old Testament on the topic of confession. They must confess their sins, to which we say, good, I'll do that. I'll confess. Uh, Whom are we confessing to? Moses continues, or God continues. Confess their sins and make full restoration. Restitution. Thank you. Another R word, we have repentance, we have reconciliation, and here's our third R word, restitution. Restitution for what they've done. That is payback. You have to make up for. It doesn't stop with saying I'm sorry. 
oh, I made a mistake. I didn't mean to. God says, no, 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 no. If you're going to keep relationships on this earth going like they're supposed to go, you have to make peace. You have, if we're going to be peace among the people, then there must be restitution for the wrong that you've done. Which we're like, can we just stop there? That's, that's enough, right? God's like, no, no, I'm not quite finished. Here you go. Adding an additional 20% and returning it to the person who you've wronged. What? Like, is that even realistic? So Old Testament, here, here, here's how confession went. Confession is me coming to you and saying, or you, or you coming to me and saying, realizing, hey, I've stolen from you. I wasn't fair. I cheated. I said what I shouldn't have said, whatever it was, right? And God, I'm really, really sorry. And God's going, okay, I'm glad you're sorry. Now go make this right. Uh, it, it's not going to be right with me until you're right with them. So go confess to them. I can't just confess to you, God. No, 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 no. Go confess to them. But if I confess to them, then I have to make restitution. Yeah. You have to pay them back plus 20%. That's the system. There's a system for that. Confession in the Old Testament was associated with and attached to restitution, reconciliation, and repentance. I'm not going to do it again because I don't want to pay another 20%. Let's be real, right? When you mess with my money, all of a sudden my attitude changes. I'm not going to do that again. And it wasn't just between God and man. It was between people and other people. One anothering one another. Now, this was a law that was given hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus, right? Okay, the Old Testament and the Jews are keeping these laws, sort of. Um, and Jesus shows up one day, and Jesus is walking down the road where, and, and everywhere Jesus went, there was a crowd, right? There was always a crowd with Jesus, which is why the religious leaders had such a hard time arresting Jesus, because he was always surrounded by people, which is why they paid someone to, to come to them and bring them Jesus when he was alone. He was always surrounded by the crowds. We, he's walking down the street one day, right? And he's a miracle worker. He's a rock star at this point. Everybody's loving Jesus. And he's going down the street and there's this guy. And he wants to see Jesus, right? But he had a little bit of a problem, a little bit of an issue. He was short. See what I did? A little bit of an issue? Short. Come on, guys. Wake up, right? He couldn't see over the crowd. His name was what? Zacchaeus. That's right. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and the wee little man was he. We all learned that in Sunday school, right? Come on. Now, I want to caution you. <laughs> I do want to caution you. Uh, though, because you may meet Zacchaeus someday and go, hey, you're that we no, you're that tax collector, right? Just remember, someday, uh, just remember, he was more than just a wee little man, okay? Someday when you meet Zacchaeus in heaven, he was more than a wee little man, okay? So Zacchaeus climbs up on a what? A sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see, right? We all know the song, come on, right? Now, Zacchaeus, he was a tax collector, right? Actually, he was more of a tax farmer. There's a slight difference. Let me tell you about Zacchaeus real quick. Zacchaeus was super, super rich. He was super, super wealthy guy because... He had tax collectors that worked for him. So he would send out the tax collectors to collect the taxes, plus a surplus. And Rome said, hey, as long as we get our taxes, you can keep the rest. So guess who the surplus went to? Zacchaeus. And they had this Roman, uh, uh, and they had Roman office, uh, soldiers that went around with all these tax farmers, and they were just wealthy. They were rich. They were traitors, and the, the Jewish people hated them. Everybody hated Zacchaeus. Everybody hated tax collectors. Everybody hated Matthew, one of the 12 disciples, because he was a tax collector, right? They were traitors. They were sinners, right? Remember in the New Testament, they would actually talk about sinners and tax gatherers? Like tax gatherers had their own category. 
There were tax gatherers and there were sinners. They weren't even the same. They couldn't even be in the same league, right? Sinners didn't even want to be associated with the tax gatherers, right? So tax gatherers had their own sinner. I'm a sinner, but at least I'm not a tax gatherer, right? Come on. It's like, that's how bad they were, right? And Jesus, Jesus stops. And Jesus sees little, little, wee little Zacchaeus up in the sycamore tree, and he says, hey, Zacchaeus, I want to go to your house, and I want to have lunch. And this kind of throws everybody off. So Zacchaeus climbs down on the tree, and they go to, Jesus goes to Zacchaeus' house, and they have lunch. And as a result of this, Jesus comes, you know, the meeting that Zacchaeus has, and Jesus, they're at this meeting, and we don't really know what's said. They have a come to Jesus meeting. Yeah, come on, y'all. That's funny. I don't care what y'all say. They had a come to Jesus meeting, right? And Zac- what we know is that when Zacchaeus, when, when they had this come to Jesus meeting, and he's done listening to what Jesus teaches, whatever Jesus taught, we don't really know. Here's how Zacchaeus responds. Luke chapter 19. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, so he's talking to Jesus, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And check this out, especially if you're thinking about what we just read in the New Testament, uh, the Old Testament, sorry, if you think about it. And if I cheated people on their taxes, and, and you know anybody who heard this is going, if you've cheated anybody, you're a tax gatherer. Of course you cheated people on your taxes. I mean, the sinners don't even want to be hang out with you, right? Come on, right? I'll give them back four times as much. That's a little bit more than 20%, right? Not even 20%. The Old Testament says that you have to give them restitution plus 20%. In other words, I'm, I'm going to confess, and I'm going to own up to what I've done, and I'm going to make restitution. And listen to how Jesus responds. And Jesus said unto him, Zacchaeus, don't get carried away. He continued, you have confessed, and it's enough that you've confessed your sins to me in private. Luke 19.9, and the John made this up version. That's not what the Bible said. I made that up. Y- y'all all fall for it too, right? That's the John made you up version. That's what JMU is. John made this up version, okay? I made that up. That's not what the Bible says. But this is what we do. We go, oh, you know what? Me and God, we had a private conversation. That's what he said. That's we're good, Right? We put a lock on it, and it's nobody's business. It's just between me and God. And I want you to know something. The God of the Bible says, no, it's not between me and you. It's between you and everybody else that's affected. That's who it's between. And when Jesus showed up at Zacchaeus' house, we don't know what Jesus said, but Zacchaeus came out on that front porch, and he said, you know what? I just want to let you know, I want your light to shine in. I want, I want to open up the lid of my soul, and I want your light to shine in, because this isn't between me and God. This is between me, God, and everybody I've offended. And I want to make it right. And here's what Jesus said. This is the answer that Jesus, this is the actual Bible. This is what Jesus says. He says, Jesus responded, salvation has come to this house today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. Jesus didn't say, no, 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 you don't need to start paying people back. You don't need to do that. You don't need to start asking people if you've offended them. You don't need to to make this public. Jesus said, absolutely, that's what confession is. Go make it right. Genuine confession leads to what? Genuine life change. Zacchaeus was never the same after his come to Jesus meeting. Never the same. And see, the problem with Zacchaeus at this point is if he's going to go to all the trouble to give half of his possessions away because he stole them anyways, if he's going to go all through the trouble of sitting down with everybody he's robbed and paying them back plus four times as much, guess what Zacchaeus is not going to do going forward? He isn't going to steal from people anymore because genuine confession leads to genuine change. All right? One more passage. One more passage. This comes from probably my second favorite person in the entire Bible. This next verse comes from James, 
the brother of Jesus, what would your brother have to do to convince you he was your Lord and Savior? <laughs> Not going to happen. Right? The guy that kind of got up, got us into all this mess with that verse, 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 you know, 122, you know, don't just hear, do what it says. The guy that started all this, right? James, the only person in the New Testament who really commands us to confess, right? This is the only place in the New Testament that I can find where it specifically commands us to, to confess, right? And listen to what James, the brother of Jesus says, James 5, confess your sins to each other, Okay, James, you don't understand. If I start confessing my sins to each other, things are going to get really complicated. You see, I like my private confessions to God or maybe to a priest that I have an occasional relationship with. But we don't work in the same place, James. He doesn't see me, you know. The priest stays at the church and I go on and fill my sin bucket up again. But if I start confessing my sins to each other, let me tell you what's going to happen, James. You're, you'll have to change, won't you? That's what James would say. You're going to have to change. You have to change to which that's the point. Genuine confession leads to genuine change. He continues, and pray for each other so that you may be healed. When you read this within the context of what James is saying, He's not addressing a religious hierarchy. He's just saying Christians, believers, followers of Jesus, when you get together, when you gather in homes, when you get into your small groups, open up your lives to each other. Open up your souls to each other. Open up that part of you that you don't want anybody else to see. To each other. You really don't want people to know because you're afraid of what they're going to do, right? You're, you're afraid of how they're going to respond if they see who you really are. And would you let the, come on, would you let the light of God's truth shine into your heart, please? Because you know what James knew, right? What many of us have, have come to know and had experienced, right? What many of us have learned the hard way what I learned the hard way, right? That secrets are like splinters. The longer they're in there, the worse they're going to get. The longer that I sat there and battled with pornography between me and God, the worse my relationship with my wife got. And until I let God shine the light in there and I confessed my sins to other people, I couldn't be healed from it. I could not. I tried everything. It's like smoking. I tried everything to quit smoking. I tried to patch. It wouldn't stick. I work in construction. It just slid off. I tried to gum. It tasted like chewing chalk. I tried other things. I tried e-cigarettes. Nothing worked until I had a supernatural encounter with God, and he set me free. But I confessed it to somebody else, and then I was set free. I was healed from it. The best thing to do with the splinter is what? Get it out. The best thing to do with your secrets, with your secret sins, the best thing you can do with your besetting sins, that's a really fancy King James way of saying your constant sins, the things that you do over and over and over again, the best thing to do with your constant sins that just keep happening over and over again, and you keep saying, God, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry, and God's going, okay, you're sorry, that's great, I know you're sorry, you don't have to tell me you're sorry anymore, let's just skip that part, I know you're sorry, I would like you to do something to handle this in such a way that there's change, because the bottom line, the bottom line is what? Genuine confession leads to genuine change. Y'all are going to be sick of hearing that. Now, let me get real personal with you all for a second. <laughs> like, I haven't been doing that already, right? The bottom line is this. If you have a secret sin, have it, whatever it is, okay? 
and you're in the rhythm of telling God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but there's no change in your life, then you need to understand there's a word for that. <laughs> and you're not going to like this at all. <laughs> there's a word for that. And you know what the word is? If, okay, let me do it the other way. If you're on the other side of this, let me flip this around so maybe you understand where I'm going with this. Let's just decide for a moment that you have some kind of retail, retail store, a cash business, a little fancy rest, family restaurant, and coffee shop, and I work for you. I'm your employee. You get Pastor John as your coffee maker, and we call it Hebrews because Hebrews coffee, right? Come on. Stop it. Anyways, and you notice week after week after week after week, there's 200 to $300 missing out of your register. You just, you, you, there is. Every week, there's two, $300 missing, week after week after week. And you finally figure out it's me. Pastor John's stealing from you. Not really. This is a made-up story. This is the JMU version, okay? Um, and so you put a camera in, somebody told you, whatever. You realize for weeks and weeks, maybe months, that I've been stealing two, $300 out of your cash register. And you confront me, and I say this. This is what I tell you. You got me. It's been me. I've been stealing from you. But before you get upset, too upset with me, understand this. I'm a Christian. And so I know I shouldn't be stealing. And I want you to know that every night when I go home, I get on my knees and I say, Dear Heavenly Father, would you please forgive me for stealing that $287.29 today out of the cash register? And before you get way too upset with me, let me know. I want you to know that because I'm a Christian, I've been supporting my church financially with the money that I steal from you. How would you respond? Would you say, oh, God bless you. You're a rock star. Probably not, right? Because at the end of the day, what, what, what are you thinking? There's a word that describes what I just described, and it starts with an H. You know what that word is? Hypocrite. You're a hypocrite. All right, John, you need to stop preaching now. We need to go home. I'm feeling really crappy about myself. You're having a religious experience, right? No, I'm just kidding. Stop it, okay? Right? You're playing a game. You're pretending to be something you're not. You got this little deal worked out where you think that you and God are cool, and you got cool because you had this little prayer thing worked out, but in the meantime, you're ripping me off. I'm ripping you off. You're a hypocrite. You can just leave that up there. Don't even take that down. I want people to read that over and over again, okay? But here's the hardest part of this sermon. And I'm trying to <laughs> try to make this quick because I want to rip the Band-Aid off quick, right? If you got this little routine worked out with God and you're a Christian, like you're a Jesus follower, you believe what the Bible says and you do what the Bible says, and people know that you go to church and you've got this little thing and you've got, the, you got it all covered up, right? And you think God is going, I don't even know what you're talking about. What are you talking about? Because I've already forgotten it, right? Or that you're already absolved of it because you went and emptied your sin bucket, right? Now go fill it up again, right? If you got this whole thing, thing going on, but <clears throat> by your own definition, if the roles were reversed, you're a what? You're a hypocrite. You're not honoring God. I got to tell you, the good news of this is God's too smart for this. What? He's not confused by this? No. He's patient. He's not confused. You're a hypocrite because you keep trying to spin the, conver the confession thing around. In the same way, so in such a way that you can feel better about what you're doing without any change. But again, genuine confession leads to genuine change. Now here's another category for you. It may be that you say, John, all right, all right, busted. I'm so busted, I've got secrets. But I got to let you know, John, you're right. You're right. I've got a little routine that I've all worked out and I do my thing, but I'm not going to change. If the point of this is for, for you to know that you've got, and the whole point of everything is that you got to change, right? But I'm really not going to change. I get the point, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not ready for change. I got this thing going on. 
My wife doesn't really know about it. I got, this, I got it all worked out, right? They're, they're in different cities. I know it's wrong, and I've told God that it's wrong, and I thought maybe I could get a little credit with God by apologizing and asking God to forgive me, but at least I've admitted it, but I'm not going to change, right? Or maybe it's, I, I've got this thing worked out. It's illegal, like it's way illegal, and I feel bad about it sometimes, um, and I've told God I feel bad about it, Sometimes. Um, so God, please forgive me. I've asked God to forgive me, but if, I, if you're talking about going into work tomorrow and saying, hey, I need to have a meeting. Hey, everybody, I want you to take a look inside here. I'm not going to do that. If that's you, I got a suggestion for you. And I'm serious about this. I'm ser- dead serious. Would you please make a shift? Would you, this is huge. This is actually going to help you. I'm not trying to be facetious. Like, this will help you. Would you please be willing to pray honestly, to quit playing, st- quit playing the stupid confession game that dishonors God and dishonors you? Would you please stop it and pray honest players? Stop. I want to challenge you to start praying like this. Dear Heavenly Father, You saw what I did today because you're not stupid or blind. And I just want to let you know, I'm going to keep doing it. In Jesus' name, amen. I can't pray like that. You're you're out of your mind. Why not? Are you a chicken? You scared? Just pray. Come on, pray real prayers. At least be honest enough with yourself and be honest with God. You're praying to him anyways. But please, don't live in this fantasy world of thinking God's going, well, at least you admitted it to me. What do you mean, at least you admitted it to him? It's God. He already knew you were doing it in the first place. If you hadn't told me, I wouldn't have known, right? No, come on. Admit things to God that no one else knows. And you aren't going to like this either. But if you don't at least admit it to God, even if you do admit it to God, guess what? It's still worthless because you're deceiving yourself to think that it's going to change anything. You're trying to deceive God, and you're trying to deceive your family, and you're trying to deceive whoever else is involved with your little secret life. So let's just be honest. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I am a Christian. I know better. I shouldn't. I'm sorry that I'm doing this. But honestly, God, I'm not sorry enough to quit. I like my parties. I like my fun. She doesn't need to know about it. And I'm going to keep playing this confession game with you. Are you cool with that? I'm just going to be honest with you, God, from now on. Please watch over my family and give me a safe trip and then start praying for all the stuff that you pray for anyways. But at least start off with the honest stuff. And then when you start asking yourself, hey, why isn't my prayers being answered? Why why aren't things working out in my favor? Because you're being a hypocrite. Stop being a hypocrite. Don't play the game with God. It dishonors God and it dishonors you. And here's why I'm telling you to do this. Because as serious as I can be, which is sometimes not very serious, but anyways, as serious as I can be, here's what I know. If you'll decide to start going to your little, you'll just, if you'll decide you're going to take your little confession thing that's worthless and just say, I'm going to stop playing that game. I'm at least going to crack my soul open and let the light of truth shine in a little bit to God. Just to itty-bitty, just crack it up. Okay. I'm going to at least start praying some honest prayers. God, I have no intentions of ending this relationship. I have no intentions of getting out of this business. I have no intentions of telling them the truth. I have no intentions. But God, I'm not going to ask you to forgive me because that's just silly. I'm not going to confess. It's like, I'm going to try to make myself feel better, but I'm I'm done. But at least I want to begin being honest dialogue with you, Father. 
maybe for the first time in a long time, and maybe, just maybe, your newfound honesty with your heavenly father will begin to form a crack in your resistance to confession. And maybe, maybe, by God's grace, you'll be so sick and tired of, of, of your duplicity and so sick and tired of the distance you feel from God and so sick and tired of the deceit, maybe, 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 maybe one day you'd be willing to really, really confess to someone where it might make a difference in your life. Right? A genuine life change can start, right? Because at the end of the day, genuine confession leads to genuine life change. But if you're, and if you're sick and tired of it, confession is a pretty simple thing. It really is. Just tell the person that you've hurt, hey, I did this. If it's a habit that no one else knows about, then tell someone that can help you. Tell the person you've robbed. Tell the person you've injured. Tell the person you were insensitive to. Tell the person that you're running around on. Tell your teacher. Tell your professor. Tell your boss. I mean, just confess. I'm confessing. I told you, God. And God said, that's awesome. Step one. You, I've already told you, God. That's step one. That's what God tells you. Step two is you've got to go tell the person that you've taken from, that you've robbed, that you hurt, that you offended. That's step two. <laughs> and if there's, if there's really not anybody in that box that you've robbed or hurt or offended, then you tell someone that you know can help you with the secret habits and the sins that can't be seen, that you can't seem to break on your own. That's what it means by confessing your sins to one another that there, and pray for one another that there may be healing. You go find somebody that can help walk you through the garbage, willing to grab you by the hand and walk you through the valley of the shadow of death and get you up on the other side of the hill. Now, you know who really gets this? You know who really understands this concept of confession? Anyone who has ever been through AA or NA or any of the A's, they get this. In fact, if that's you and you've been in this room, you're probably thinking, the rest of you guys haven't figured this out yet? Because there are habits, there are addictions, and there are sin patterns that you can't break by telling God about it alone. And it's not because there's something wrong with God it's not because there's something wrong with you. It's because God put you into a body. And God connected us to people. And God connected us to relationships. And the people and the advice and the strength that you need is available. But to get it, you've got to open up that little thing in your life that you don't want to open up to someone besides God. There are habits and addictions that will never be broken by simple willpower as people have struggled on their own. You've done it. I've done it. And it's never going to change. The change came in my life when there was genuine confession that led to genuine change came from me opening up those dark little secrets in my life and letting God's light shine in on them. When God took his little flashlight and shined it into my dark little heart and my hole, and I confessed my issues. Guess what? I have never struggled with pornography since I've confessed it, and God shined his light on it. Never. Now, that's not the story for all of you. That's just my story. You need to confess to someone, real life, flesh and blood people. And I know the tension is this. Here, here, and I don't live in a fantasy world, right? I get this. You know what the tension is? It's this right here. It's our fear of consequence. It's our fear of consequence. Look at this. It's our fear of consequence. We fear the consequence of confession more than we fear the consequence of concealment. We fear the consequence of confession 
what they're going to say, what's going to happen, more than we feel the con- fear the consequence of us hiding it. Now, let me tell you who fears the, the, the consequences of con- confession. More than they fear the consequence of concealment. Let me tell you who those people are. Those are the people who have yet to experience the full-blown consequences of the concealment. Those are the people that like concealment over confession because you haven't experienced what happens when that concealment explodes in your face. But ultimately, ultimately, the fear, the, the, the consequence of concealments are far worse than the consequence of confession. Right? You're going, mm, nope. No, 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 no. You don't know my wife. <laughs> you don't know my mama. Listen, secrets grow. They're like splinters, right? They get stronger and they get darker and they begin to impact all your relationships in your life, not just the one that it started with. And you carry certain secrets from chapter to chapter to chapter to chapter, from stage to stage to stage of your life. The consequences grow and they grow and they grow. Confession, when you confess, here's the cool thing about when you confess, the consequences are immediate. Because when you tell her that you're doing it, guess what? She explodes right then and there. Your consequences are immediate and they're local. The consequences of concealment stretch out and can stretch out over your entire lifetime. God knows how many people you've hurt since you haven't confessed your sin anyways. So you know what? Confession. Confession. That's what Christians are supposed to do. Don't just talk to God privately about it, but go to one another and to the people that you've wounded and the people that you've offended because at the end of the day, what? Genuine confession leads to genuine change. So let me ask you this, as we're bringing this this to a close. Let me ask you this. What's in your box? What's in your bucket that you've been telling God as if God needed you to tell him that you were doing it? But I mean, you've got the whole little thing figured out, right? You got the whole little deal worked out with God. But you know, come on, you know that there's no change in your life. There's no freedom from it. You're not a different person because you're still doing it. You're just a church person with a secret sin. The secret sin that you've kind of arranged this little deal with God, but there's no change. You're a hypocrite. And you don't want to be a hypocrite. In fact, None of us wants to be hypocrites. But that's what you're becoming because you're playing your little confession game with God. So what do you need to tell? What do you need to tell and whom do you need to tell it to? What do you need to tell and whom do you need to tell? And did you know that if you're willing and able and ready to decide, you know what? I think I'm going to fear the consequence of concealment more than the consequence of confession. You know what? And you begin to open that little box. And you start to open that box, the appropriate, into the right people. You're going to see life change. Like maybe you've never thought was possible. I didn't know what was going to happen when God shined the light of pornography on my life. I thought I was going to lose everything. Next month is my 17th year anniversary. I feared the consequence of concealment more than a consequence of confession. Things drastically changed in my life when I was able to actually come out and be open about what I was dealing with. Because confession is extraordinarily, extraordinarily powerful. Because confession is a part of the sequence of events that bridges, that brings about real life change in your life. Because at the end of the day, what? 
Genuine confession leads to genuine change. So what do you need to tell? And who do you need to tell it to? Now, are you ready to put on your big boy pants, your big girl pants, and have the difficult conversations, but decide, you know what? I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a Christian. Why in the world would I want to live any other way than wide open? And why would I want to forfeit the freedom of having things exposed that makes me a better person than living in my life in the dark? So what do you need to tell? And whom do you need to tell? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you that you've modeled this throughout the entire Bible. That is confession. Confession makes genuine change in our life. That we go to you for forgiveness, but we go to each other for healing. So we thank you, Father, that we can confess our sins to one another. And here's the crazy thing, Father, and we don't even understand this. When we confess our sins to each other, guess what? More than likely we're going to go, oh, you too? Oh, you too? I get that. So, Father, give us eyes to see the dark and secret sins of our life the way that you see them. Because you're not surprised by them. You're not scared by them. It didn't take you off guard. So give us eyes to see them the way you see them. And give us ears to the people that we need to go speak to them about it. And then give us the courage to do it. To be real, authentic Christians. And confess our sins to one another. And pray for one another that there could be healing in the body of Christ. Today, today, today. What do you need to tell and whom do we need to tell it to, God? Make it open, make it bright, make, it light, make the light shine through, Father. Because this morning, what we know is that we need you. We need you every moment of every day through everything that we're going through. We need you. We need your joy, we need your peace, we need your love, we need your, we need you. So Father, just give us hearts that are broken for what breaks yours. And what breaks yours are a bunch of people that say they love you and then turn around and act like hypocrites. So give us the courage to be real, authentic Christians with each other that we're not scared to go to one another. We don't fear the consequence of telling, of confession, but we're no longer gonna be scared of the consequence of concealing it. We ask all of these things in the most powerful name, most powerful name of Jesus. Amen.